Well, hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to St. Edwards University, the virtual hilltop, if you will. My name is Dinah Sibeljo Kennard. I'm the Director of Admission Partnerships and Programs at St. Edwards, and it's wonderful to be with you today. Thank you so much for taking time to connect with us online and hear more about the video game development and animation programs at St. Edwards. Um, our speaker today is Professor Robert Denton Bryant. He is the director of both of those programs and has a wonderful presentation prepared for you. But before we turn it, before I turn it over to Professor Bryant, I wanted to go over just a few logistics related to Zoom. The chat feature has been just enabled for the webinar. And in lieu of that, we invite you to ask questions through the Q&A tool in webinar. So um, if you look down at the ribbon on the side or at the bottom of your Zoom uh, configuration, you will see there that there's an opportunity um, to submit a question through the Q&A tool. You are welcome to um, submit questions as Professor Bryant is speaking and kind of delivering the content of the presentation but we will essentially leave your questions until the end and kind of address them in the open Q&A forum, which will take place as soon as the formal presentation is over. So if you think of a question as, as Professor Bryant is speaking, feel free to contribute it. Otherwise you can wait until the end and contribute your questions then. And we certainly will stay online and connected with you as long as you have questions. So hope you enjoy the presentation today. I'll see you again when we get to the end of the presentation. For now, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Bryant. Thanks for thanks for coming. Um, I really uh, appreciate it's it's Friday in December and things get very busy, and many of you are at different points of your uh, uh, your own uh, 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 school year, and so uh, I'm grateful that we had so many participants today. Uh, I'm going to try to make this worth your time. Um, so I'm Bob Bryant. I uh, I'm the director of video game development and animation here at St. Edwards. We're in the Department of Visual Studies in the School of Arts and Humanities uh, here in Austin, Texas. Um, so who am I and what's my point? Um, uh, you can call me Bob. Um, I'm Choco Bob on Xbox Live. I am Choco Bob with no space on PlayStation Network. I'm Shogo underscore Bob on Steam and Epic. Uh, I'm Chocoba, no more lock on the scenario server in World of Warcraft. And I almost hate to admit, I got back on the hamster wheel of Warcraft last uh, week because of the Shadowlands expansion. So I'm that guy playing Warcraft again. <sighs> and I'm at Thumb Candy on Twitter, um, if you're a Twitter person. Um, so how did I get to this point? I started off in motion pictures. I have a degree, I have a MFA, but it isn't an MFA in games because there were no uh, master's degrees in games when I was in graduate school. I was a film school kid and I went to USC film school. And while I was in school, I got a job in the marketing department of a motion picture studio, Canon Films. And one of the first movies I ever worked on was Masters of the Universe, the motion picture. And I worked on some other cool stuff, including Bloodsport, which is one of the uh, inspirations for Mortal Kombat. Um, and I really enjoyed working in Hollywood for in all kinds of capacities for about 10 years. Um, but I was a, I was a frustrated and, and a fledgling screenwriter and I worked as a story editor. I'd worked with producers. I'd written on my own stuff. I had stuff uh, in development at Amblin Entertainment, but never anything that made it through the whole gantlet to get produced. And so I was a little frustrated by that. And so after about 10 years, I did a complete gear change and got into video games by uh, becoming a tester, starting at the ground floor, entry level position, a game tester at Mattel, when Mattel, the toy company, because at the time in the late 90s, they were into uh, uh, publishing uh, video games and, and entertainment software and PC hybrid toys and stuff like that. Um, worked on a bunch of cool stuff, including the, one of the very first 3D RTS games, Earth 2150. I got a, my first design credit as co-designer of the Nick Click Nickelode Nickelodeon themed uh, digital camera. Um, I was one of the first lecturers on the topic of game testing 
at the Game Developers Conference. Uh, I left Mattel because the whole division closed. Uh, Mattel exited software. And so I moved over to Crave Entertainment uh, as originally a tester, then QA director, and then uh, director of product development. So I was lead tester on uh, Freedom Force, worked on a bunch of really cool stuff, got to green light some things that I came up with, uh, was executive producer of Elf, the movie, the game, um, and uh, got to think up my own franchises, which was really cool. So uh, uh, World Championship Poker and Pinball Hall of Fame, and to an extent, the Bible game were all me coming up with what would be a cool franchise, what, what parts of the market are not served. Uh, and so that was really exciting. Um, and uh, somehow found time to co-write a book that's now in its third edition, Game Testing All-in-One, which is like the, the book that Sony and Microsoft used to train its game testers. Um, had a consulting firm, still do. Uh, helping people out with game-related stuff. I've done uh, mobile publishing in the early days. Um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's been a very rapid, very busy, very rewarding career uh, for the last 20 years or so in video games. <sighs> I'm also co-author of um, a book about game writing called... Uh, uh, Slay the Dragon, Writing Great Video Games. And what I'm proud of this uh, uh, book for a lot of reasons, but it's also the very first book I've written that's been translated into another language. This is the Chinese version of Slay the Dragon. And uh, that's really cool because now I've written a book that I can't read because it's in Chinese. So that's kind of cool. All right. So why are we here? What's the commonality between my background, which is film, and my second and major career, which is video games, uh, and uh, animation, which many of you are interested in. And the through line through all of it is storytelling, right? From my uh, days in elementary school, I've always considered myself a storyteller and while I was in Hollywood and working in video games, helping to make video games and work with developers, I felt like um, that is one of the most important things, not the only thing, but one of the most important things that really gets those players engaged with the game. And so let's talk about uh, story structure, right? All stories, what makes a story? All stories have to have a beginning. In Hollywood, we call that act one. Needs to have a muddle, right? Needs to, things need to get complicated. That's called act two. And you have to wind things up at some point. It needs to be resolved and that's act three, right? Every story has to have a beginning, a muddle, and an end. Not a middle, a muddle. A middle is neutral. A muddle is complicated. A muddle is messy. A muddle is thorny. That's what makes it interesting. Ooh, wow, that's a predicament. How are they going to get out of that? That's, that's a good second act, right? The beginning of your story has to lay all the pipe has to introduce us to the world and the characters, right? Our hero or heroine, but let's just say our protagonist, in their ordinary world, right? But a problem has to arise, right? If I told you about, oh, I woke up today, I had a healthy and nutritious and fiber-filled breakfast, and I drove to work, and I hit all green lights going to work, and, and uh, the weather was nice and uh, I got to work okay. You keep waiting for something to happen, right? Otherwise, it's not a great story, right? When everything goes well, when the status quo is not changed, it's not a story. You want something to happen. You want a problem to arise. You know, oh, well, I was driving to work 
And then there was a giant cement truck sideways on the road and traffic was blacked, backed up for blocks. Now it's a story. It's still a boring story because it's about traffic, but at least you understand that it's a story. Something's going wrong. And the hero of this story, me, has to deal with how do I get around the cement truck so I'm not late for work, right? This is a terrible example, and I regret introducing it already, but you get my point, right? The model, this is the fun part. Uh, our hero or heroine devise a plan. There's a problem, how do I solve the problem? That plan cannot go well, okay? If the, if the protagonist devises a plan and everything goes according to plan, then it's just as boring as my all green light obstacle free drive to work. It's not a real story. We want stuff to get uh, janky. We want stuff to get complicated. We want assumptions that we made to be undercut. We want complications to ensue. That's what keeps us interested. We want people fighting because that's interesting, right? And our protagonist or protagonists need to adapt because we love to see people overcome problems, right? Oh, curveball, how do they address with that? Oh, they were expecting this, that thing didn't happen, how do they adapt? That's what we really like to see in a story for about two hours, and then we're ready for it to end. So by the end of the movie, or the novel, or whatever, we want to see some type of resolution. We want some validation that we've been watching this story or reading this story uh, and haven't been wasting our time. So we want some type of satisfying conclusion. It can be a happy ending. It can be a sad ending. But it has to have some sort of satisfaction at the end of it, right? The problem has to be solved somehow. And the story has to be resolved. All of the main questions, not every question, but all of the main questions that you had throughout the story are somehow answered. Does that make sense? Let's do an example that I'm hoping most of you are familiar with, and that's the Shrek. Let's look at the Shrek and see if this template holds. Let's analyze, let's do story analysis on Shrek, okay? Here's our hero, Shrek, in his ordinary world, which is the swamp. He's an ogre, he enjoys uh, bathing in the swamp, he's alone, he can be ogre-like, um, he's happy as a clam, okay? That's his ordinary world, except Shrek being content not having problems is happy Shrek for Shrek, but it's boring Shrek for us. We want something to happen. And what happens? What's the worst thing that could happen to somebody who likes solitude? Boom. Refugee crisis. All of the magic characters, all of the fairy tale characters are forced to like leave their homes in the kingdom and hang out in the swamp with Shrek. And he's upset because he didn't want these people, uh, you know, uh, infringing in his space. And so he goes straight to Farquaad and says, what are you gonna do about this? And uh, Farquaad says, well, help me help you. I have, a, I have a, a package I need picked up. If you can do that, then I'll see what I can do about getting those uh, annoying people out of your swamp. And so he goes on a quest. And the quest is to go rescue Princess Fiona from the dra dragon, right? Well, what's what did I say uh, about models? Things have to go wrong, right? What's the very first thing that goes wrong when he goes on that quest for Fiona? He meets Donkey. Donkey, even though I love Donkey, he's a complication. Because one of the things we know about Shrek is that Shrek likes, likes to be alone. He's gruff. He's an ogre. <sighs> and so the story, the, the writers of the story, saddle, there's a pun, 
Shrek with the worst traveling companion, which is the most annoying animal on four legs in uh, uh, Western civilization, and that's Donkey. Where Shrek is gruff and withdrawn, Donkey is happy and optimistic and chatty and won't ever shut up. And so the two of them uh, are a great partnership because there's conflict inherent in the relationship because they're two very different personality types, right? So Donkey is a complication, but he's entertaining because he's a complication, because he's constantly annoying Shrek. The plan further goes awry because even though uh, with a lot of uh, twisty and turny action sequences and you don't know if the dragon's going to win and you don't know if Shrek is going to be able to get Fiona out of the castle and is Donkey going to survive the ordeal, blah, 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 blah. They finally get Fiona out of the castle, back to the kingdom, delivered to Farquaad, except what's the most... Uh, what's the greatest complication to the whole plan? Shrek didn't plan on falling in love with Fiona, but he does. So that's complicated. Wow. How are you going to resolve that conflict? What happens next? And what answer, happens, of course, is that Shrek decides to come out of his shell. He decides to interrupt the wedding. Yada, yada, yada. True love's first kiss. Turns out Fiona was an ogre herself, and so they get married and they live happily ever after, and because it's a Shrek movie dance party, right? Okay, does that make sense? I hope that made sense. And if you, if you have questions, again, type them in the chat and I'll get to those at the end of this, uh, at the end of the presentation, because I'm eager to uh, hear from you about your questions. Let's do another movie though, just really quick, just to where we can verify that this template holds, right? This is an older movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark. And if you haven't seen it, I think you'd enjoy it. <sighs> Indiana Jones is in, in the very first act, we see him in his ordinary world, which is to us extraordinary because he's sort of a rogue archeologist and he's in some Ancient temple, G, ancient temple deep in the South American jungle somewhere. And he's found this beautiful gold idol that's surrounded by deadly traps. And he manages to get the idol and bring it out of the temple, right? First study. Um, but that's very exotic to us. And yet for him, it's what he does. That is his ordinary world. You know, he raids tombs. About 20 years before, Laura Croft raided tombs for 15 years. A problem arises, and it's a very, very, uh, you know, very familiar problem, but a very effective problem. And that problem is Nazis. Nazis are collecting all of these biblical treasures because nefarious Nazi purposes. And so they're, at, they're searching for the Ark of the Covenant this big fancy sarcophagus that house the Ten Commandments, right? You can't think of any artifact probably more significant in human history than something like this. And the Nazis could find it before the Allies do. And so Indiana Jones is sent to find the Ark of the Covenant before the Nazis do. And he has a clue as to where it is, but the complication is his ex-girlfriend has his former mentor's notes because his former mentor was her is her dad so he's got to deal with his ex-girlfriend to get the notes that have the note uh, the the map to where the ark of the covenant might be right ex-girlfriend complicated awkward okay the plan after lots of twins twists and turns and action sequences goes awry, Indiana Jones finds the sarcophagus before the Nazis do. But it goes awry because the Nazis take the sarcophagus and they're going to open it before Indiana Jones can. And so he and his ex-girlfriend are tied to a stake and the Nazis, it looks like the Nazis are going to win because they're going to open the sarcophagus and use all the magic stuff that's in there and see the Ten Commandments and everything like that. In this case, 
what resolves the story in the third act what we often is is what we often call a deus ex machina ending god coming down from the machine and in this case the deus ex machina is actual god who melts all the nazis faces and indiana jones and his girlfriend escape and the sarcophagus is safely in government storage in some warehouse somewhere to this day good movie if you've never seen it again if you have any questions ask them in the chat does this seem like a template it is it absolutely is a template and it's a template that was first sort of articulated by aristotle 300 years bce um in a book called the poetics where he had read a lot of plays watched a lot of plays growing up had noticed that certain plays there's a certain common structure to many of these that are effective and this is what it is right so my question is is that if you've read a book why read another book if you've read a novel okay you've read a novel why read another novel if you've seen a movie and you enjoyed it good good for you why why see another movie right if they're all the same structurally then why do we see why are we, why do we enjoy movies so much why do we enjoy novels so much and the answer is the specifics of the story same structure different details different settings different uh antagonists villains uh different themes right different stories explore different themes and that's something that uh, you know is very important for us and here's the fun part especially with video games and animation different stories are set in different imaginative worlds and one of the courses i teach personally is called world building where we together explore a range of imaginative worlds in the nerd genres like science fiction and fantasy and horror and fairy tales um and learn what uh first of all the rules of each genre and what works and what considerations you have to have and we study a lot of existing imaginative worlds so that when it comes time to you creating your imaginative world you have a body of scholarship and experience and a and a structure to approach that, right? Okay. So let's talk about video games for a second. We talked about story, let's talk about games. What's a game? What is a game? How do you define a game, right? One of my favorite definitions is this. A game is an experience created by rules, okay? And that's broad enough to encaps encapsulate a lot of different experiences that we kind of refer to as games. An experience created by rules. Even something that, like Minecraft, which might seem to you as kind of a digital sandbox, or it doesn't seem really to be a game because you're crafting stuff, well, there are still rules because you still have to gather all of the items to craft the thing you want. There's still physics and, uh, uh, you know, parameters that define the experience of navigating and building and seeking in that world. So there's still, you know, to me, that's what makes Minecraft a game, even though Minecraft in creative mode, you know, doesn't really have victory conditions it's still a game right okay and, and this is from anna anthropy whose book rise of the video game zinesters i read five or six years ago and i got so excited about it that she was the inspiration for my book slay the dragon okay <clears throat> so what must every story have right What's the difference between games and uh, stories? And what's the how are games and stories similar, right? What must every story had? We already said a beginning, middle, of an end. <sighs> but it's the, the beginning, the statement of the problem, right? The complication. There has to be a conflict. 
that begins the story. And our the time we spend following the story is us being curious about how they're going to resolve this, the conflict. In Star Wars, which you may know as Star Wars episode IV A New Hope, but I'm old, so I just refer to it as Star Wars, you know, the good one. Um, the statement of the problem is very early on. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. Why did this random email wind up on this robot? And who is Obi-Wan Kenobi? And why does she need help, uh, right? And it can't be easy. There's, there's, there's mystery there. Who's Obi-Wan Kenobi? Who's the princess sending the message? But also, gosh, you know, she's rebelling against the Galactic Empire. That seems really hard, okay? And because it's hard, it's interesting. What must every game have? Let's change gears. What must every game have? And some of you will say, oh, a controller or, you know, victory conditions or, you know, level bosses. But it's much more fundamental than that to me. To me, a game is not a game without a quest, an object of the game. And I grew up where so many American board games, you read the instructions, which were always on the inside of the lid, the top lid. At the very top, it said the object of the game. And it told you in one or two sentences what you needed to do to win the game right? Which is very much like what uh, the details of a quest are. In order to succeed, in order to complete the quest, you need to go to this dungeon, kill this many or uh, orcs, find this many rare drops, yada, 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 right? And like uh, the problem in the story, the objective of the, of the quest can't be easy or it's not fun, right? So there's a commonality of challenge. An interesting story is one that presents a challenging problem. An interesting game is one that presents a challenging problem. You beginning to see the difference there, the congruence between what we want as players or as audience members of our games or our stories. So this tension between storytelling and game design, uh, Keith, my writing partner, and I kind of sum up in Slay the Dragon as we summarize this as Aristotle versus Mario. The tension between the impulse to tell a story and the impulse to let the player play a game, right? Mario versus Aristotle or drama versus fun. Drama versus fun, right? And there's a tension there because the more story there is in the video game, the more players itch to say, yes, 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 story. But if I wanted to watch a movie, I would have watched a movie. This is a game. When do I get to take over the controller? Versus if it's all gameplay that doesn't have any sort of narrative progression or narrative impact, then it's sort of meaningless and people lose, uh, lose uh, interest, right? What's the essence of drama? And I, I fat fingered the keyboard, so you've already seen it. The essence of drama is conflict. We've been talking about that since I started. You know, there has to be conflict, conflict of personalities, conflict of goals. And this image of the protester stopping a tank column during pro democracy riots in. Uh, in China in the very late 80s, I think is the perfect uh, depiction of one person standing up to a giant authoritarian uh, totalitarian state. This to me is the essence of, of a conflict because it's one man versus how many tanks? Four? That's a pretty good conflict. What's the essence of fun? What is the essence of fun? What is the one thing you have to have without which you're not going to have any fun? And this is a hard one to think about. My theory is, and this is how I, the approach I used to teach game design, 
that the essence of fun is surprise. The minute you stop being surprised, you stop having fun. If you think about the last time you played solitaire, the reason solitaire works is a game, even though it's kind of a dull game, it does work because you're trying to find cards to stack on other cards and you're drawing from a deck blindly. And every time you turn uh, three cards over, you're like, oh, did I get the red three that I need to play the black two on? No, I didn't, I got something else. There's little surprises and they're usually negative, but occasionally we get a positive surprise. Yay, and we get a little dopamine hit in our brain and that's what keeps us playing. Even a game is sort of primitive or rudimentary as, as uh, solitaire, right? <sighs> okay. You didn't know there'd be a one question quiz. This is my one question quiz for you. What was the first game you ever played? Think about it for a second. I'll wait. Okay, what was the first game you ever played? And I guarantee you that for most of you, the game you're thinking of was not the first game you ever played. I'm gonna suggest that the first game you ever played was Peekaboo. And if you think about it, Peekaboo is never a game that you choose to play. It's a game that you are victimized by a, someone older or someone who is at least behind you putting their hands over your eyes. Uh, and as when you were a little kid, you're like, oh, well, that's it. You know, I checked out. That was a good life, a little short. And then they take their hands away and you see that, oh, there's your mom. She didn't disappear. She's right here. <gasps> Yay. And you're surprised still to be alive. And so that's kind of fun, right? Okay. So I'm going to suggest that Peekaboo, the very first game you ever, ever uh, were forced to play, <sighs> demonstrates that essence of fun because it's surprising when they take their hands away, right? But stories have to have surprises, right? What's the worst thing you could say about a movie or a novel? It was predictable. You knew what was going to happen, right? You're looking for surprises in your stories, and you're looking for conflict in your games. Games can't be easy or they stop being fun. They stop being challenging. You put them away, you move on to the next thing, right? So the challenge of the game writer, and sometimes in the industry nowadays, they're called narrative designers, is that you um, keep the player involved in the story you're trying to tell through long periods of gameplay. Because let's face it, for the most part, players are there to play a game rather than engage in a story. And there are different levels of story for different types of games. A completely abstract puzzle game like Bejeweled really doesn't have a story. On the other hand, a very story heavy visual novel has very little gameplay. So it's a spectrum but no matter where your game falls on the spectrum, you have to strike this balance. And it's a challenge. And it's something that we work on in our curriculum by studying how to create gameplay, how to tell stories, and then in interactive storytelling, which is a class you'll take your junior year, we'll bring it together. So let's talk about the curriculum, the VGAM, Video Game Development Curriculum at St. Ed's here. The degree program is Bachelor of Arts in Video Game Development, not design, although it includes design, but video game development. And that's like so many uh, words, words mean things, that's one of our mottos. We're very precise in our language here. And video game development means the whole process, including design. But the whole process of video game development is coming up with a concept, 
coming up with a gameplay design. What does the player get to do? Coming up with a uh, narrative framework for the game, the story of the game. Coming up with the game looks, the visual design of the game, how the game sounds, the sound effects, the sound scheme of the game, and then producing that, dividing a team up into individual uh, players and individual tasks for each of the team members to do, then bringing it all together, testing it, showing it to an audience, getting their feedback, uh, changing the game again, and then finally releasing. We teach you that entire process. So that is the development process, not just game design, which relates to what's fun for the player to do and eliminates all the other parts, right? Focus on the entire production process. That's what this major is about. Select VGAM courses is not the whole list. History of video games, which I teach. First semester, freshman year, you're gonna take a class from me where you're gonna learn about the video game, uh, about video game history from three perspectives. Technology, obviously, because it's computer games. Culture, which you're probably the most conversant in because I'm guessing many of you who want to make video games have played a lot of video games, so video game culture. And then thirdly, um, the business, which is probably the part you're least familiar with, except as a customer. And I'm here to fill in the gaps in your worldview to make you understand why things are the way they are and how we in the video game business as creators can continue to make money, even though it's really hard to make money in the games business right now because there's so many games on so many different platforms. Interaction analog game design, we study human interaction with systems. Then we study human interactions with systems designed to entertain, you call them games. And then we put that into practice by studying and creating tabletop games, analog games, board games. And that's the first game design class you take because it's really important to understand the nature of gameplay in a tabletop game before you get the computers involved, right? World building, which I kind of told you about, Introduction to game audio, where you learn about sound design and uh, digital recording and, and uh, sound effects and dialogue recording. Computer science concepts one, which is a very low level programming class designed for non programming majors. And it, uh, uh, you know, teaches you the fundamentals of computer science of software and a scripting language called Python which is a good first language to learn. Digital media production planning, because um, we you need project management skills to get all the people on a team coordinated, working together, talking together, solving problems, keeping them on schedule so you can release your game on time. Introduction to game animation, which is 2D flat animation in a, on a computer. Uh, advanced game animation, which is 3D animation in like Maya or, or 3D Studio Max or Blender on a computer. Uh, game Design Studio One, which is gameplay in 2D. Game Design Studio Two, which is now that you know how to create gameplay in 2D, Let's try to make a video game in 3D, right? In Unity. Interactive storytelling, which I told you about. And then the culminating experience, the senior year, you are in a class in a two semester sequence as part of a team, optimally about five or six people, but sometimes a little more, sometimes a little uh, fewer, just depending upon uh, the conditions in that semester. Um, but essentially, you're on a team making a game for an entire academic year, your entire senior year. And in the spring of that senior year, I actually guest lecture in that uh, class a couple times. And I start working with you on your resume and your marketing plan for your job 
and uh, you know, job tips, job tips and tricks, job seeking tips and tricks. I can't talk today, sorry. And uh, uh, you know how to polish your and present your portfolio, all of those things. Okay, VGAM, you can major in video game development, but you can also minor in video game development. And that's really cool because we have a lot, we have a very good computer science department here. And a lot of, not uh, a lot of those students, not a majority, but a significant number of those students want to get their computer science degree so they can work in the games industry. And so they are minoring in video game development taking a select few of our classes so they can get a minor in games to inform their uh, broader uh, computer science major. And that will give them a really interesting story to tell on their resumes as they go into the games industry and try to look for programming jobs, right? But that's just one example. Our minors major in uh, a range of fields, including just unintuitive and fascinating combinations like behavioral neuroscience, right? Okay. So that's video game development. And again, if there's anything you're curious about that I haven't asked, uh, I haven't answered, please hit that chat button and uh, let, or the Q&A button. I'm sorry, the Q&A button. I keep saying the chat button. Uh, please enter it in the Q&A tool and I'll address those in just a second. But I want to tell you about the animation major. You, it's a Bachelor of Arts in animation and it includes such courses as foundations in animation where you learn different modes of animation. There's a very big difference between doing traditional hand-drawn cell animation in the classic Disney style and doing tabletop uh, uh, stop motion animation, like with Robot Chicken or Koopa on the Two Strings or, uh, or something like that. And so we uh, teach you a range of different modes. We teach you uh, a technique that I never heard of called sand animation, right? Uh, so foundations animation kind of takes you through different tools and modes and methods of animation. Playwriting workshop which is required for both the animation major and the video game major, teaches you everything that I uh, talked about at the very beginning of this chat today, which is three-act structure and dialogue and character, really important. Sequential art is a required course for the animation major because sequential art means comics, yes, but it also gets you to think in terms of shots. And so it's a great class to take so you can learn how to do storyboards, which are the first step in creating your animated film, designing the, the, the shot sequence you want in your animated film. Kinestasis and motion graphics, which are two uh, more advanced uh, techniques in animation. Compositing and visual effects. Animation anymore. Very, uh, uh, doesn't always exist by itself. Very often we add animation to an existing live action shot, right? You've heard of that term green screen, where we put a live actor in the foreground and we do some crazy animated background uh, that we replace the green screen with. That uh, technique where we use um, Adobe After Effects. <sighs> Uh, we teach compositing and we also teach special uh, speech, bleh, sorry, animated visual effects. And then finally, animation production, where you get to learn all of these skills you've learned in all of these classes building up to your senior year. You'll take animation production, which is you making an animated film all by yourself in one semester. Okay. And we also have an animation minor. Okay. Animation minor pairs well with a bunch of different majors. Many of our VGAM majors are animation minors. There are some creative writing majors who are animation minors because they want to write for the animation industry. Um, all kinds of different things. <sighs> Finally, what's so cool about both these programs and what's so cool about St. Edwards itself 
is it's a wonderful historic campus, Holy Cross Mission, all of that amazing thing. But we're in Austin, Texas. Now, what's great about Austin, Texas, if you're like me, you've had a career in entertainment and digital entertainment, is how many employers and how many great big uh, and small companies are moving their staff and making Aux uh, strengthening Austin's established reputation as a nexus of digital entertainment, right? We have all of the giant game companies almost represented here. I heard Konami is opening a, an office here very soon. Activision Blizzard, EA has been here. Bethesda Zenimax have been here for a long time. And then Microsoft bought them earlier in the year. And so Microsoft's put footprint in Austin is much bigger than it was. Apple is here. Amazon is here. Um, Twitch is here, which is owned by Amazon. Uh, Facebook and Instagram have big uh, footprint here, feet print, uh, footprints here. Rooster Teeth, Powerhouse Studios, who you may not have heard of, but if you've seen Castlevania or Blood of Zeus on Netflix, the, those are produced here. Wizard 101, maybe your little siblings play Wizard 101 online. That's produced here. Daybreak Game Company, which holds a whole, uh, publishes a whole bunch of online games. Some of them very uh, uh, established like uh, EverQuest and uh, DC Universe, they're here. So it's a great place to be because we have a rich uh, community. We have many, many networking opportunities. There's great exciting, I, I love bringing guest speakers from the local um, industry to campus to meet the students. Um, so it's a great place to be and a great place for you to begin your career. Are there any questions? Why, yes, there are. <laughs> I was Thanks afraid so much, of that. Professor Bryant. I'm going to give you a second to just catch your breath, grab a sip of water if you want, as we have questions come in. But um, thank you so much for that wealth of information, both about kind of storytelling, which you said is the through line for, for both programs. Um, as well as for film and, and TV and uh, creation just in general, but also um, talking more about the two programs kind of in more detail. I know we have a big audience today. We have people from uh, the local area, from Texas and also from out of state. We have high school seniors, potential transfer students as well. So please do add your question students as you have things that you would like to know. Um, we do have one question already that I wanna begin with. Um, are there any close partnerships between St. Edwards and development studios, VGAM studios um, in the Austin area that, or, or perhaps even outside of the Austin area that help students with internships and career options. So you can talk a little bit about kind of how our students, Bob, take advantage of, of the wealth of, of studios and, and, and sure. places that they can connect with here in Austin, um, as well as outside of Austin um, as they're here at the Hilltop and then looking to transition from the Hilltop. Sure, so one of the, one of the great things about uh, being a St. Edwards student is we have a very strong career and professional development department that I work with and have for four years. Um, whenever they hear of an internship opportunity or a job opportunity, they let me know whenever I am out schmoozing with uh, industry people or, or going to networking events and I get a lead on uh, a company that needs an internship or, or, or needs employees, I let them know. And so there's a lot of back and forth between this uh, uh, staff of professionals in career and professional development and me and, and the faculty here. Um, so that there are multiple opportunities for you as a student or as a recent alumni to, to keep your ear to the ground and hear about opportunities as they arise. We also, I'm very proud because we're, we're in our, I guess, fourth or fifth year to where we're getting to be a, uh, uh, getting to have a critical mass of alumni, folks who graduated St. Ed's from VGAM, who are working in local industry, who are still part of our community, who come back to campus for game fair, our student showcase, and so there's a broader community of alumni 
working at a range of different companies. Right off the top of my head, we have uh, um, we have alumni who have uh, or students who have graduated VGAM and have worked at BioWare, are working at Aspire, which is a publisher here in town, um, at uh, Cloud Imperium Games, which publishes that big space MMO. I forget their name. I uh, forget the name of the game. Um, uh, uh, Activision. Um, we have students at uh, NCSoft. We have students, uh, no, I'm sorry, we have graduates at NCSoft. We have graduates at uh, Bethesda Zenimax, now Microsoft. Um, we've had students go on to work at EA. And here's the other thing. We also have students that work not just in the games industry, or they'll work in the games industry, and then they'll get uh, recruited to uh, what I term a grown-up software company like Facebook. We have alumni at Facebook. We have alumni at, at Instagram. And we have alumni at Box, which is a cloud storage solution company, a big global uh, technology company. One of my things that you'll hear me say your senior year is that you get to decide, now that you're about to graduate, you get to define success on your own terms. I'm not going to define success for you. I just want you to get a job. I want you to get a job that you're happy with and you're rewarded by. If that's in the games industry, great. But if it isn't in the games industry and you're learning all the stuff, you learn all the stuff that you learned in this program and wind up working at Amazon or Google or Facebook or a broader tech company or a tech startup that I've never heard of, and you're happy, then I'm happy, you know? You don't ever have to come to me and say, well, I'm sorry I failed you, I'm not working again. That's not the point, you know? Everything we talk about is in the context of games, but in the broader sense, you're learning all kinds of digital project management skills that are applicable to a range of job opportunities, not just in games, even though games is a multi-billion dollar global business. Does that help? Uh, how many students are typically entering freshman class and typically graduating senior class? Hmm. And I think, and 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 um, Gabe, feel free to drop in a, a follow-up question, but I don't know if the question relates specifically to VGAM and animation in terms of how many students are in these programs in the freshman class or the right. graduating yeah. class. I'll just say roughly every year we have a freshman class of around 600 to 650 students at the university, um, the first time freshmen. And video game uh, development is one of our top 10 most popular majors at the university. Animation's a new major that we just started this fall. Professor Bryant, I'll let you kind of expand more on that, but the numbers are certainly smaller in animation since right. that began. Right. Um, but right. I think Gabe was asking specifically about VGAM, um, okay. about how many students do we currently have in that program, Bob? I know that it, you know, again, as I said, it's one of the 10 most popular majors. We yeah. have 50 plus yeah. majors at the university. So it is a quite a sizable, um, a number of students um, yeah. in the freshman class and then throughout the program, but you sure. might be able to better answer. Sure. Um, uh, so uh, I, I have a good sense of this because I teach the freshman class, which is the, the fall freshman class, which is your first class in the major, which is video game history. And I generally have 30, 32 students in that. Okay. And some are minors. So, um, uh, you know, and some are uh, taking it as an elective, um, but for the most part, there's, there, there's been steady over the last three or four years, about 24 majors, and some a trit out, but also some a trit in, because the wonderful thing about St. Edwards is, you know, you choosing a major right now before you enter, that's not like the sorting hat at Hogwarts. The point of the liberal arts Holy Cross tradition is that this is an environment for you to explore academically. And if you decide that you want to change majors, we at the university want you to, you know, be able to make that change. And so we have students that move out of a video game uh, major, but also some that uh, originally majored in something else. And then they discover, oh, there's a video game major, like, wow, I'm gonna transfer into that. So it stays pretty stable. We also have uh, transfers from uh, community colleges 
in the uh, area that transfer in because we're a popular place to finish a two-year degree. And so, um, you know, we're generally graduating uh, uh, 18 to 24 at the end of it, plus or minus. You know, uh, it's early days uh, for me. So, you know, we're, we're in year, I want to say five. And so the numbers aren't steady. They're still growing. But anecdotally, that's kind of my perception of what it is. Um, with animation, we have, uh, we start off strong our first year, we had 24 declared animation minors. And this fall, fall of 2020, because you heard it was 2020, it's not surprising that we only had a handful of starts in our animation major because 2020, but we really expect, Dinah and I really expect that to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, just as robust a major as, as VGAP. Does that help? Yes, okay. I think it does. And I, I and just as a follow-up to that, I would say that, you know, I think um, it's helpful to remind students too that not everyone who's in the VGAM or animation program is a major. There are, there are students also who are minoring and perhaps yeah. majoring in something else. And right. as you mentioned, Bob, uh, computer science is a popular program that often, often has a lot of transference where students are also minoring in VGAM. And computer science is I think our fourth or fifth most popular major at the university. So there are a lot of students majoring in computer right. science at St. Edward's. Right. And, and it is just computer science. I always hesitate to talk about computer science too much um, because uh, I don't want you thinking that, well, I'm not good with code, so I can't do VM. We have just as many minors who come from like writing and rhetoric or psychology or from uh, communications. You know, like I say, our very first minor in VGAM was behavioral neuroscience. All right. This woman will graduate this spring with a degree in behavioral neuroscience with a video game development minor. And she's going to be a billionaire in about 10 years. I just get this feeling. Um, I want to get to Abigail's question because they're very yes, good questions. Absolutely. What programs should I know prior to my freshman year as an animation major? Nothing. Okay. You should know. Uh, you should know uh, Google Chrome, okay, and you should know the Microsoft uh, Office or Google Docs. I mean, we design our curriculum assuming that you don't, you've never touched uh, Photoshop before. Um, although if you knew Photoshop, that would be great. Any knowledge you bring is helpful, but we don't assume that you have taken any classes prior to this, right? Um, so you're gonna, we're gonna teach you everything you need to learn. So don't worry about that. You also don't need to have taken, for instance, if you wanna do VGAM, you don't need to have taken a lot of computer uh, science or a lot of programming classes because not everybody has that opportunity in high school. We don't assume that you come in knowing JavaScript, for instance. We'll teach that to you, don't sweat it. If you have existing knowledge, great. You're going to be that much more ahead and that much more comfortable in class. But there's no requirements, and we don't we don't ask you to test in, right? We there's no vetting process. If Dinah says you get to come to St. Ed's, then that's fine with me, right? I'm not competent to do any further vetting on top of her 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 process. And can you do a minor in art with animation? Absolutely, and we have art minors and animation majors. We have animation majors with an art minor because what's cool about our animation program is that we're in the School of Visual Studies where we have such a robust studio art tradition. The reason that I got really uh, excited about bringing animation to campus is that we're building on the foundation of visual art of, of traditional studio art, because I can't tell you how many sad looking student portfolios I've looked at as a hiring manager, where it's obvious that the student conflates knowing Photoshop with being an artist. Okay, that's like, I know Microsoft Word, I can take you through a tutorial that shows you every option, every menu option on Microsoft Word, that doesn't make me a novelist. What makes me a novelist is taking creative writing courses and doing a lot of writing 
such as the studio art courses here and one of the uh, required uh, courses for both animation and uh, 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 video games is foundation drawing, which is pencils on paper. There's no computer involved um, other than to take attendance or something. Um, but it's that skill of you being able to draw outside of the context of a computer that will make you head and shoulders above all of these other kids coming out of these digital only schools that know the tools, but they don't have the eye or they don't have what we used to say at my last studio I worked in, they don't have the wrist, right? We, we will teach you that wrist. No open questions. I think my job here is done unless there's anything else. Well, this has been a wonderful presentation with lots of great information. I do want to give our students one last opportunity to drop in any remaining questions um, that might exist before Professor Bryant has to sign off. Um, I do have a quick question for you, Bob, though. Um, this might be on the minds of some of our students. Similar to the question about like what kinds of coursework do, do students need to have before they come into St. Edwards and you answer that brilliantly. Of course, we will teach them once they get here. They don't have to come in kind of already knowing certain things. Mm -hmm. um, but can you talk a little bit about just the, the hardware and the equipment that is available for students in the program here? I know that might be a question too that students have. Do I need to have a certain type of machine or a certain type of software to be a VGAMR animation uh, major or minor at St. Edwards? So what kinds of things uh, do we have available at St. Edwards to provide resources to students? And, and, and is there something that they need to bring with them. Okay, so I'm going to give you the non-COVID answer because we're, we, we've been teaching virtually this term to be safe and we have students living on campus but they're still uh, taking the bulk of their classes virtually whether they're doing that from their dorm room on their laptop or from a computer lab here in, in school. So we're going to get through, I'm very optimistic that we as a, as a, as a, as a planet are going to get through COVID uh, uh, sooner, I hope, rather than later, um, but not next semester. Next semester, we're still virtual. Um, but I'm hoping by the time you all get here, um, that we'll be sort of back to a new normal and you're not going to need to worry about having a really robust computer because we have computer facilities here, right? We have Game Lab, which has very robust uh, computers with the Adobe Creative uh, Suite and with Blender and with 3D Studio Max and Maya and Game Maker and uh, or, um, I forget, oh, oh, Unity, right? So, you don't have to have uh, uh, all of those licenses yourself. We will provide computers here on campus. And in some cases, it, it depends on program to program. Uh, we may be able to either uh, get you a free license, a free student license, or a discount by virtue of the fact that you um, uh, are a student. Um, to where if you want to have a copy on your private computer, you can do that, right? <sighs> Same with animation, right? Um, in an ideal world, you're bringing a la laptop of your own to campus, but it isn't an ideal world and not everybody can afford that. If you can't afford that, we have computers here uh, that where you can work. Um, we're also in the middle, I had a meeting this morning where we're planning the animation classroom, Dinah. Uh, you and I haven't circled back on this, which is going to be housed in the library building, in the computer, one of the computer rooms in the library building. And we're really excited about that because that's going to be an all, all Cintiq lab. And Cintiqs are those big computer monitors that you actually can draw directly on. It's like a big iPad. And uh, we're going to have uh, initially 20 seats, and then we'll grow as needed in that classroom. And that's going to be the main animation classroom, where the bulk of the animation classes are going to be taught. And that's going to be really exciting, because the students are going to be able to create, uh, create art directly onto the screen on those Cintiq uh, 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 workstations 
that's going to be really exciting. And also, just adjacent to the animation uh, classroom, we're going to have a number of animation workspaces where you can do tabletop stop motion robot chicken animation with lights already set in there and everything, or top down animation stand animation for your flipbook style Disney uh, type of hand drawn uh, animation. And we're also going to figure out we haven't we haven't uh, we haven't got this locked down, but we will have some type of green screen studio there with existing lights and a green screen where you can take your uh, actor, put them in front of the green screen, uh, do video of them performing in some way, and then bring that into After Effects and, and zhuzh that up however you want to. So uh, the nexus of the animation department is going to be in the library and that's going to be pretty exciting because it's a that's a beautiful building and it's a showcase for uh, campus and uh, we expect that to be a beehive of creativity in addition to a knowledge uh, mall so it'll be fun. I love the concept of a knowledge mall that's super exciting news and so for everyone listening to this webinar right now and in the future you're really hearing things that uh, that are fresh off the press, if you will, about the animation program at St. Edwards and, and just all that awaits students um, who are looking to study that as well as BGAM. So thank you so much for your time today, Professor Bryant. I do wanna give students an opportunity to follow up with you if they have any questions. So do you mind um, kind of sharing your email address with students? I also wanna let students know that if you have questions for us in the admission office, something related to the admission application process, financial aid, scholarships, if there's any way that we can be of assistance to get you connected to Professor Bryant or to others on campus um, or ourselves answer your questions, please don't hesitate to reach us. Our email address is admit at stedwards.edu. You can also go on online and find our address at the St. Edwards website. Um, but we do know this has been an incredibly challenging time for those of you, especially who are high school seniors or perhaps transfer students who are going through a college search process right now in the middle of a global pandemic. So. Please know that we are here for you. We are um, happy to connect with you in any way that we can be of help in providing information, support, um, getting you connected to others who can provide additional information. Just know that um, we're all in this together, that we have come this far, 10 months, nine months, 10 months into this, um, and that hope is on the way, that we will be out of this um, at some point in the relatively near future, but we know there's still some time to go. So hang in there, you guys. I know this has been a really challenging time in, in your lives and, and for your families. And I hope everyone has been staying safe and um, staying sane, uh, which is also important. So just uh, um, wanted to kind of mention that from, from the admission side of the house that we're here. And so Professor Bryant has shared his information. Um, Bob, I'll give you an opportunity to say some closing words before we, before we close out. That's it. Um, I hope I hear from you in email if you have any further questions. Otherwise, I will see you in September. And Diane's yes. the only one that gets that reference. So uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that mercy chuckle. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, and as, as, as Professor Bryant mentioned at the opening of this presentation, certainly you can find him online at, at different video game uh, platforms and connect and, and play and um, and do all of the things that hopefully we'll all get to enjoy some, some downtime over these next few weeks as, as we enter the holiday season and the winter break. If you will receive a survey after this students for attending this presentation. So thanks in advance for taking an opportunity to answer that and give us some feedback. For anyone who wants a reporting of this presentation, reach out to us in the admission office. You can also email me directly, dinahs at stedwards.edu and I'm happy to provide that to you. So. Um, thanks again. Thank you, Professor Bryant, for your time. I know that our students just wrapped finals and you're busy grading. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And um, again, have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, be well, and happy holidays. <laughs>